gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Bob Melamed. Thank you, Hutch, and thank everybody, especially the organizers, because this is what has to happen everywhere around the world, and it is happening everywhere around the world, thankfully. So um, what I want to do is talk about things in a very different fashion than um, what most people are accustomed to. And in fact, what I really want to do is I want to bring together the spirituality with the science, because in fact, anything that's true has to be true for everything that's true. So whatever's real in spirituality, whatever's real in science, there has to be a junction of truth between them. And I feel very satisfied personally with how I now understand what I call the physics of life. Because if we are going to try to explore how to promote health, both in terms of individual health, but in terms of social and planetary health, we should have some idea of what life is. I don't think anybody in this room would bring their car to a mechanic who didn't know how a car worked. But we go to doctors who don't really have a foundational understanding of what life is. And this is true, sadly, of, of, of our scientists and the whole scientific medical establishment that, that we all live under. And the tragic truth that I've come to realize f for myself is that we are living in a world of false to use Donald Trump's phrase, fake medicine and fake, uh, fake science in many respects because of how we have not moved beyond the kind of thinking that really represents a hundred years of wonderful thinking and wonderful creativity, but never got us beyond the stagnation of, uh, of the kind of revolution that's required in order for us to move on to the next level of humanity, the, the consciousness that we've heard spoken of. And for me, that is simply a natural unfolding of an unfolding universe. And that's what I want to try to convey these aspects uh, of what is going on. So what I'd like everyone to do, if I can figure out how to move my own thing here, um, would be to basically forget what you're thinking about, what you think you know, and just go with what I have to say. Don't over-criticize it. Listen to the whole story as much as I'll be able to get through, because it's really impossible to do it in this amount of time. It takes about two hours to give a fairly full-fledged overview of what I'm talking about. But the aim is that the kinds of details that, for example, Ethan does a wonderful job of presenting, and they're so essential for us to understand. But what we need to do is understand them in the context of what life is and how those things impinge on that process. And one of the overarching themes that I'm going to talk about has to do ultimately with the energy sources that cells use to power themselves, to power life, and to manifest itself in everything. And it turns out that those energy sources have profoundly different uh, values to them. And the kinds of things, uh, if you look at literally all of those various chemicals that you saw on the board earlier today, the terpenes and the flavonoids and all, they all, for the most part, have a common mode of functioning. Even though we can look at the specific pathways, if you stand back and you say what's really going on, you'll see that most of them turn on fat burning via AMP kinase. And the magic of turning on fat burning is that that's when cells are recycling. And what they're doing is they're recycling their damaged pieces. And how were those pieces damaged? They were damaged when we made energy efficiently by utilizing carbohydrates in what's known as the electron transport system. So it's the dialogue between doing things, activating things, your muscles, your, your pancreas, your hormones, your brain, all of those things are always done with a foundational activation of calcium. And that has to do with the origins of life. So what I really want to do is give you a flavor for a different way of thinking and understanding what life is, what life is a part of, because it's all part of this expansion, this uh, the, the unfolding of the universe, basically. And we have been part of a chemical reaction, a chemical reaction that has gone on since the planet formed. We'll, we'll start there. We don't have to go back to the Big Bang, all right? What I try to do is keep theory in a functional mode. Because what I'm interested in 
is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs> so we will see where we get. And all of the physics, the foundation of all of my thinking comes from Nobel laureate Ilya Prigogine, who was one of the truly great geniuses that humanity has created. And um, what he does is he creates a whole new vision of just everyday reality. We are involved in an unfolding of the universe. And as it unfolds, it creates time. It's not like time is sitting there with a clock, because that's the way we're trained to think about it. But there's a process of unfolding. And intrinsic in that process is the evolutionary process. And in order to have evolution, you have to power life. And in order to power life, you need these energy sources. And it's the way they work together, the combination of doing things and then protecting what you're doing. It's the same in society. If all we do is build and we don't recycle and we don't care about the pollution we're generating, society will collapse. The reason for that is because society is an echo of the physics of life. So we will continue, if I can. So the, a key concept here is that life is a dynamic fractal. Now, does it, who, who knows what a fractal is? Just so I get some. So a lot of you know. OK. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just give a quick picture here, actually a little quick movie of a, of a fractal. Oh, if I can get my act together, which I can can't do. Uh, and that should just be playing. And why is it not playing? Ah. <laughs> Let me. Uh, I have to get out of this mode, I guess, and I don't know where I am. It came up in an unusual place, and I didn't fix it. Anyway, maybe I'll just have to bypass the movie, which is a shame, because it's a nice movie. Here we go, we can do it from here. If my cursor appears again, there we go. All right. So what a fractal is, whoops. I got it. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, uh, now I have to torture myself more. Why did that happen? There's always something. Maybe I should just move on. Anyway, a fractal is an algorithm whereby it generates a picture, an image of some sort. And it so happens that the algorithm allows you to reiterate the, the, the math, and it'll regenerate images. So you can like scope in, like you could look at a little piece of my ear, and bring it up, and you'd see another ear. And then if you look closely, you'd see another ear, and you'd bring it up, and you'd see another ear. Okay? So it'll repeat patterns by a mathematical algorithm. So what I'm proposing is that we look at Let's see if I can get anything. Oh, no. I'm going to have to fool around with it. A dynamic fractal. And what, what a dynamic fractal in my version of reality is, is that every time you reiterate that algorithm, you change it. And what do you change it based on? You change it based on your first algorithm changed the environment. The environment changed you. If you want to adapt, you now have to change back to the environment that you changed. So it is this constant process of unfolding, and that's what evolution is. And we, again, are all part of this big chemistry set, but we make the mistake, we have the illusion that we are individuals. And in fact, the way I look at things is I look at the planet, the big chemistry set, and within that chemistry set, you have the biochemistry of humanity. And within the biochemistry of humanity, th there are certain rules as to what's going on in this unfolding process as we get smarter. A key concept here is that it's not that we evolve in time. It's that evolution, the power, the flow of energy, generates the time. At equilibrium, which is the way most of our physics and most of our chemistry has as its origins, what's called the reversibility of time. Because that allowed simple math. And that simple math allowed for a very powerful development of, of, of concepts in the field, in particular, say, thermodynamics. 
but it was all based on equilibrium. When you have equilibrium, you don't have flow and you don't have time because everything's already done at equilibrium. So there's a new field of physics, and this is what Prigogine created, called far from equilibrium thermodynamics. So it's what happens when energy is flowing. And in order to formalize that mathematically so that you can have like the logical proofs that everybody will universally accept, they had to actually create new math in order to break the symmetry of time. Because the physics that we're taught in our schools says time can go backwards. Well, are you getting younger? When's the last time you drove your car and the gas tank filled up? You know, those things don't happen. There is an arrow to time. And what Prigogine's work was, did was he broke the symmetry, so now we no longer have this reversibility of time. We have an unfolding of time. And that unfolding is driven by the flow of energy keeping us further from equilibrium. So a summary statement that's very important, I think, for people to understand is that health is defined, in my mind at least, by our distance from equilibrium. And as we age, we return back to equilibrium. The complexity, the negative entropy of our chemistry decreases. And what I want to talk about is how that's happening, why that's happening, how the energy of our food the fat versus the carbohydrates has a profound impact on the ultimate outcome. And I apply these things to myself as well, uh, just so we have a reference point here. You know, I've been using cannabis for 53 years on a daily basis. I start the day by eating at least 100 milligrams of oil, and I do that a few more times throughout the day. But I've reversed a lot of my conditions by combining my cannabis use with my nutraceuticals that ultimately manipulate metabolism. I will be 70 years old in December, all right? I feel that I have been successful. <laughs> Which, you know, I have, I have a lot of pain. I have a lot of things going on. I've got my whole body is arthritic, you know? I'm HLA B27, you know what that means. I don't have ankylosing spondylitis because I've used cannabis my whole life. I am positive for the rheumatoid factor. I've got gout, I've on and on and on. But you see, I'm fine <laughs> and I can go run a mile, you know? Because I apply not just cannabis, but everything else that I'm telling you about, all right? So, <coughs> where are we over here? Th these are concepts that I want you to start to think about because these are not things that we think about and they're rather mind blowing. So, um, first of all, there's about 50 billion tons of DNA on the planet. So we're talking about a very successful molecule, all right? And then every day a person makes approximately their own body weight in ATP. Well, you know, th that seems to be a little bit of a, how can I be making that much of ATP when I'm not getting bigger, you know? It's the flow. You make, you break. You make, you break. You make, you break, okay? And that's what's flow. We are flow-dependent structures. That's what Prigogine got his Nobel Prize for, the concepts and the math and the understanding of what flow-dependent structures are. So a human cell has about two meters of DNA in it. And if you took all the DNA from a person and you stretched it out, it would go from here to the sun and back 400 times. Think about that, how small this stuff is. Every one of your cells has a, two yards of DNA in it, two meters of DNA. Think of what must go on when that cell replicates, because you can't even see the cell and you got two meters of stuff twined up in there that's got to replicate and can't make mistakes or you come down with cancer and other illnesses. So this is total lunacy when you think about what I'm saying here. And then to top all of that off, a single free radical molecule could kill you. A single molecule, one time, could kill you, all right? Why? Because if that molecule hit a critical base in a critical gene that was controlling cell division and your DNA repair system didn't see it and your antioxidants didn't quench it before the, the, the damage, and your, then your immune system doesn't see that you now have a cancer cell, and then you go and you do chemo, and that selects for drug resistance, we'll go into that, and then you finally go back to cannabis, and if you're lucky, you're able to overcome the damage done by the chemo, and uh, if you're lucky, you get rid of everything. But there's, it's not that simple. And I, I've got about 90 YouTubes out there that describe a different version of reality, my version. Either I'm insane, well, everybody else is insane, all right? And it's open for debate. 
<laughs> but I'm very confident in what I know because I've, it's so integrated and it's always answering all the questions that are asked when I read all of the papers that I read, which is all I do. I sit around stoned. I'm ADD. I got the TV on. I got the computer on my lap and I read all day, every day, other than being a slave to my children. So, <laughs> all right, now it gets even crazier. One molecule can kill you. Every one of your 15 trillion cells every day sustains 20,000 of the damages where one in one cell, one time, could kill you. What does that suggest to you? To me, it says we must have an incredible amount of biochemical complexity devoted to preventing us from dying from all the free radicals we're making. And I believe absolutely that is the answer. And it's the free radicals that guide everything. Because as we do things, we make them. As we make them, we create damages. DNA, RNA, proteins, fats, everything gets oxidized by, or reduced, depending on the type of free radical, by free radicals. They react with everything, all right? So <coughs> what we want to be able to do is keep that at a sustainable level where we're able to fix the damages that are caused by the free radicals and a rate proportional somewhat to how, how much we're creating. It's kind of, think of your bathtub, you know, you have a, if you have the water running and it's going out the outflow, if you have it right, you can just keep it going, right? But if you have too much water, it'll, it'll overflow, or if you had the plug out, you know, and you weren't keeping it right, it'll, it'll drain, right? We are the same way. We are filled with the organization of life, the Holy Spirit, if you will. But it's not a static entity. It's a flowing entity coming from, you know, as we, <laughs> coming from the universe. It's all part of this continuity, all right? So half of us, in my mind, is, meaning on a cellular biochemical level, is devoted for us to do things, and the other half is devoted for us to be able to fix the things so we can keep doing things. We have to keep growing. We have to keep moving further from equilibrium. Your chronological age is not what matters. The fact that I'm 70 is not what matters. How far am I from equilibrium is what matters. And you know, you could be six years old and dying because you're closer to equilibrium, or you could be 100 years old riding a horse running around because you're further from equilibrium. All right, that's what it all is. It's all about organization that's maintained by the flow of energy through you. So. And these are some quotes that just really capture the concept of this constant creativity. You know, when, when, when the Bible says man's created in God's image, well, what is God's image? Creation. Creativity. See, for me, God is generalized open system dynamics, the flow of energy. All right? <laughs> but it doesn't matter because no matter what your religion is, people it will accept science to a certain degree. You know, most people will not walk in front of a car because they have some concept of momentum, you know, or falling off a roof. They understand gravity, you know. So what I'm saying is that once everybody understands what I'm suggesting, if I'm right and not totally insane, or maybe both, or neither, <laughs> then we will see a transition occurring because what we are as individuals are not individuals, other than that we are quantized probes of that collective human biochemistry. And what are we probes for? Adaptability. That's what evolution works off of, adaptability. You're not the biggest, you're not the strongest, you're the most adaptable, you're not the smartest. None of that is what matters. It's how it all comes together so you can adapt to survive. And that's what your cells are trying to do all the time as we keep trying to do things and kill ourselves in the process. So one of the most important take-home messages, I'm going to say it right now before I forget, because I'm a total airhead, all right, <laughs> is that you have to shift your balance of carbohydrate intake and fat intake. You want to take more healthy fats and less carbohydrates, especially like you should never drink soda or any of that crap. That's just like ridiculous nonsense for your body. All it does is promote free radicals, doesn't give you any health, and it, it helps promote all the age-related illnesses. Diabetes, heart disease, think about it. Use a little common sense. Are you going to have clogged arteries if you're burning fat, if the fat is what clogs your arteries? No. But what you don't know, because it's not generally accepted as reality, but happens to be fully 100% true, is guess what? You make fat out of carbohydrates. 
And why do you make the fats out of the carbohydrates? So you won't burn them and make too many free radicals and kill yourself. But it turns out that that fat is pro-inflammatory as well. So it's only a temporary solution. And other solutions that our cells have to not die from producing too many free radicals is they'll make fibers. So your fibrotic diseases are all an effort of your cells to stay alive because either by genetic mechanisms, because of your problems, genetic problems, or because of your life history, in particular the food you eat and the toxins you were exposed to, that is what leads into these problems that have to then be recycled, burnt up, and gotten rid of. But you can only do that if you're building enough and recycling in appropriate fashion. All right. So anyway, the more deeply we study the nature of time, the better we understand that duration means invention, creations of forms, continuous elaboration of the absolutely new. Because this second is different than that second. And that is the absolutely new that manifests itself in life and evolution. And another one of his sayings is, we are actually the children of the arrow of time, of evolution, not its progenitors. And this refers to, for those of you who are in you know, quantum theory, where Schrodinger's box, you know, you have, a, you, ha you have a cat in the box and you throw some cyanide in, but you know, the cat is not dead or alive until you make the measurement. That's the foundation of this reversible time-based physics, which Prigogine blows out of the water with what he's done. So, the, it means that we don't create time by making a measurement. We're part of this unfolding process. So here's an, an example of one of these flow-dependent structures. This is an example of something that is counterintuitive to us. What you're seeing is a liquid in a Petri dish. So there's about 10 mLs, OK? Which amounts to like 10 to the 20-something molecules. We're talking about billions and trillions of molecules. And when you heat them, what, every, what we're all taught in school is that the molecules will move faster, they'll rotate faster. If there's a reaction, it'll occur faster. What we are not taught is that at all the possibility that something like this could occur. And it's the spontaneous formation of organized hexagonal convection cells. What, what I mean is this. Here, I'm taking that and turning it on its side. So you're heating it from below. The hot molecules are going up the side of the hexagon, giving their heat up above, and then the cooled ones are coming through the center, and you're forming like a bucket brigade for heat. How can that happen? <laughs> it happens because by those structures forming, they are generating more entropy, more waste to the universe. A simple way to remember it is collections of molecules, like us, We'll get smarter as long as we can make the universe stupider quicker. <laughs> All right? That's the way things work. That's reality. All right? So in this case here, we're looking at a thermal gradient generating the organization. In the next slide, you're seeing a redox reaction, a reaction where chemicals have electrons that they want to give to something else, and something else wants to take them. That's electricity, All right? Bioelectricity we call redox. So what you're seeing here is another Petri dish. And chemicals were mixed together and thrown in there. And spontaneously, organization occurs. You can see the organization because there's an indicator in there that tells you whether the molecules are oxidized or reduced. So you see that there's a heterogeneity. They're not all the same, even though we would expect it to be all the same. It's a liquid. So what's going on there? All right, It's showing you that flowing energy organizes matter. And by doing that, it's making that reaction occur more rapidly so that in the end, the potential is dissipated to the universe quicker, made the universe stupider quicker. All right? <laughs> so now I'm going to show you a little video of it. It's one of the reactions I did in, in, in the lab. And you'll see the color start in the bottom of the tube. Because when you do it in a test tube, it's more three-dimensional. But there's another factor that I want to emphasize to you when this thing finally starts happening. You'll, you'll, it'll move up from the bottom. Come on, come on. I should shorten this video. Is it working? Maybe it wasn't working. Oh, no. It sounds like it's working, but I don't, oh, there you go. Oh, you have it and I don't. OK. <laughs> so what you'll see is, this, obviously, it's random, right? There's no possibility that there's any organization left. And from the bottom there, you'll see a blue color, which indicates reduced molecules. And you'll see that it'll move up and disappear. 
and then come back. See, there it goes. And then it'll come back and do it again. These are periodic reactions driven by the fact that you have flow potential of electrons and matter gets organized. But what you think, what you're seeing, think about it, are two things. You're seeing organization in space and you're seeing organization in time because it comes and it goes. We are nothing but cycles of coming and going, of oscillations, of reactions and chemistries and electronics, everything vibrating together, all right? And what you're seeing, if you think about it, you got your heart rate, right? That's a temporal structure, a structure in time. You got your breathing, you got menstrual cycles. All of these things are natural oscillations that come to a point where we can kind of measure them and see them. But on a subcellular level, for any of you who've taken psychedelics and Wahaska and LSD, you know, you know the flowing cosmic beauty of like psychedelics, that's what it looks like in your cells. That's what's going on. It's that harmony where everything's moving with everything else, weaving together, and it's all driven by the flow of energy. Stop eating, you die. Stop eating, you, you, you know, the structure, the flow-dependent structure goes away. <laughs> That's what death is. It's a far from equilibrium phase change. Back to a state of lower organization. So whatever, it ha if there's anything with spirit, somehow that, that's captured, okay? I don't understand enough, but I'm open to everything. So what I'm going to show you in a second is a metabolic map. Anybody remember that? <laughs> now, the, the problem with this map is it's too simple. <laughs> Literally. Because what, they, what you're looking at here is a snapshot in time. You're not seeing any flow. Therefore, there is no time. Okay, so what you're seeing are all these possible chemical reactions and their linkages, but what you're missing is the thing that makes it alive. And what makes it alive is when it's flowing, all of those things, every one of those points has an enzyme that allows the reaction to occur, because the reactions in your body would not occur unless you had enzymes that allowed them to occur at room temperature, okay? Otherwise, we would not be here, okay? So all of those things have enzymes. All of those enzymes are controlled in terms of their function, in terms of their translation from RNA, in terms of transcription from DNA to RNA, and in terms of the genetic architecture of the DNA as to whether something's available to be expressed or not. So the whole thing that makes that alive is missing. All right, and yet this is, we're not taught that aspect. We're taught, oh, we get this metabolic map here, you know? Well, this is nonsense unless you can make it and relate it to life. And what we'll see is that our cannabinoid system is the overall regulator of everything in your body from conception until death. So your immune system, digestive system, cardiovascular system, skin, bones, muscle, everything is regulated from conception until death. Every time you get hungry, it's because your brain makes endocannabinoids. You give yourself the munchies. The reason the plant works is because it's how you work. And this plant can tap into how you work. And the reason pharmaceuticals are total bullshit for the most part is because they're founded on the wrong principles. And I say that using a pharmaceutical every day that's keeping my heart in rhythm, all right? But that, there's so much more that I can't talk about related to that just because we don't have the time. But the point here is that what we have to be able to do is manipulate our biochemical flow in a way that keeps us further from equilibrium. And as we age, what happens is the weakest link in our flow-dependent biochemistry is what gets us, all right? My genetics makes it all this inflammatory crap that I deal with, all right? Had I had other diets and things that I do, I'd probably be dead now with a heart attack. But thankfully, I'm not. So, you know, again, back to this psychedelic picture, you know, you want all that harmonizing flow, and you don't want too much disruption. All right. So, evolution, nat life naturally selects for survival of flow-dependent structures through adaptation as long as adaptable conditions and sufficient time is allowed, okay? Where I want to go with this is I want to point out some things that I believe are incredibly important and totally revolutionary. And sadly, the scientists will not talk with me about it because I've rejected them and they've rejected me. 
and I'm happy with the separation in general, other than the fact that if they knew more of what I know, we would all be better off, because instead of peddling poison, we'd be able to start manipulating the biochemical flow. When you make xenobiotics, the way the, chemi the pharmaceutical companies are making chemicals, all right? For a long time, I didn't, you know, I, it didn't bother me that much. I'm thinking, all right, so you have this chemical, and it's going to do this. Then it finally dawned on me, well, if you don't have the pathways to synthesize the chemical, and you don't have the pathways to break down the chemical as part of the normal healthy flow, what happens? Well, they'll get broken down by means by which we get rid of, you know, some of our garbage. But you don't know what products are going to be made along the way. You don't know where they're going to go and what they're going to do because they've never been part of the flow. They haven't had selective pressures working on them. So for the most part, they're not going to work other than to generate side effects and give you temporary relief. And this, one, of the, one of the really scary samples of that is with chemotherapy because and there's peer-reviewed literature showing it. What you do is you select for the drug resistance. And let me explain what that means in my mind, because that's completely different from what it means in everybody else's mind, all right? Your cells, in order for them to live, have to constantly be adapting to their environment. They've got to be either muscling or thinking or seeing or smelling or whatever they're doing, they're doing something, okay? <coughs> and they have to be able to know when they have to, what they have to do to adapt. So there's like a layer of, of how we deal with free radicals. Because when we use the electron transport system, we make energy efficiently. But we make it dangerously because that's where most of our free radicals come from. So we have this dichotomy. We want it. We need it. That's what powers evolution. And that's, in my mind, what powered the evolution of humanity. It was the CB1 receptor, which first appeared with the vertebrates. Not invertebrates, vertebrates, OK? Once we got our brains in the vertebrates, we had the CB1 receptor. And what, we, what it does on a molecular level, if you understand how things work, then all of the other stuff starts to become apparent to you. What, what the CB1 receptor does is it regulates calcium channels, among other things. But the calcium channels are important because they activate everything. And if you're eating too much sugar, and then the calcium is part of the signaling that's saying to the mitochondria, you know, burn more sugar, burn more sugar. But then you make these free radicals, and the system adjusts to it, all right? Because remember, the system, half of it is just to survive the free radicals. So it's adjusting to what's going on by shifting all the biochemical flows. So think of a road map, a city. You want to get from here to the other side of the city. You've got all those possibilities. Some are high speed, some are slow speed, some are broken. That's the way it's going through you, the flow, OK? And what you want to do is to be able to optimally get from one side of the city to the other without damaging everything and without, in some proper time. So, what the pharmaceutical industry in general is doing is working on the level of the differentiated cell, the cell that's communicating with its environment and putting out more, uh, ideally, uh, entropy and taking in negative entropy order, OK? But <coughs> I need a drink here. When you turn on recycling, what the cells do is they stop talking to their environment. And they say, I've got enough problems that I've got to cool what I'm doing, and I've got to fix me. It's kind of like Trump for president, in a sense. Yeah. <laughs> America first. No, cell first. The cell is now saying, I don't want to deal with the world anymore. I'm going to fix myself. And if that can occur, then that cell can go on to live a healthy part of you. Or if it can't, if it does it, but it doesn't do it in the right way, then it becomes a cancer cell or a misguided immune cell for autoimmune diseases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ultimately, all age-related illnesses come from these excess free radicals. So where was I going with all of this? Yeah. So your electron transport system, remember, one molecule can kill you. Every year, you make about four kilograms of superoxide, which is a free radical. Which is, again, why I emphasize how much of what we are has to be designed to protect us. And guess what? That's why I'm here. Because we're now going from, I'm explaining why we can manipulate things on a biochemical basis, but how do we do it? We have to know we can do it. And then we have to go and do it. 
<laughs> so that's all part of the system getting smarter. And what's happening now is the Earth, the chemistry set of the planet, is undergoing a far from equilibrium phase change. And what that means is we see our weather patterns changing. We see our financial situation. See, before a phase change occurs, before there's a far from equilibrium phase change, the variables of the system, instead of vibrating like this, they start to go crazy. And we're seeing that everywhere in the world right now. We see it in our pol politics. We're seeing it in the finances. We're seeing it in the tides. We're seeing it in the weather. So the planet is undergoing a rearrangement. And what I believe is that rearrangement is part of our evolution as well. And that, I don't know how many of you know my blip flip story. You know, you can divide the world into two, two categories of people. People who have above average cannabinoid activity and people who have less than average cannabinoid activity. Now, if you don't make enough so you're more unstoned, what's that going to mean? Anxious, uptight, fearful, you know, all the crap we see. Because the people who run the world are what I call blips, the backward-looking cannabinoid-deficient people. <laughs> and, you know, the Bible says it, the meek shall inherit the earth. Well, who are the meek? And then the stoner says, yeah, all right, so you, you only stuck me in jail for 20 years. You didn't give me life. Fuck you, is my answer, you know? I mean, this is just ludicrous. We're talking about a God-given plant, whatever God you want to talk about. We're talking about growing lettuce in our backyard. And I'll shut up. Yes, <laughs> We're done. <laughs> so you can see I hardly got started. But just, just so you CB2 turns on fat burning. CB1 allows you to burn sugar safely. That's why your brain needed it, because it's so organized, it'll fry without it. It's always hot anyway. It can't get any hotter, all right? So sugar burning, your heart, 60% of it comes from fat burning. Why make free radicals when you don't need them? Stem cells burn fat. That's why they don't age. You need CB1 to turn on electron transport so they can differentiate and make neurons and blood cells. Yeah.